Down these mean streets a man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. He is the hero. He is everything. He must be a complete man and a common man, and yet an unusual man. He must be, to use a rather weathered phrase, a man of honor, by instinct, by inevitability, without thought of it, and certainly without saying it. He must be the best man in the world, and a good enough man for any world. Philip Marlowe by Raymond Chandler August Our Marlowe sat Buddha-like at the edge of his deck as the darkness gathered around him. It had been some time since his last transmission. The air smelled of smoke. These were the days of falling ash, gray skies, and unnerving politics. Fear and hope struggled for supremacy in the land where many were prophesizing doom, although the weather was perfect, and while inspiration had been scarce, Marlowe knew, out of a deep pocket of calm, it would always come. Marlowe was a believer, and so he waited. A shift of wind and wind chimes came to life on his patio. The ringing of bells stirred his imagination, and images danced before him, and he heard ting, 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 ding, 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 and the wind blew harder, and the palm tree was swaying, and he thought he heard the palm god say, Behold, Marlowe, gird up thy loins. The imagery was not good. There was suffering and unrest and deadly wars the world was at a loss how to stop. His eyes burned from the smoke. In the last few days, it hadn't been easy to breathe. Marlowe knew the artist was needed more than ever. The very nature of reality was at stake, and truth seemed a thin membrane of goo you could poke your pinky through. Marlowe, the optimist, the believer of the Hollywood ending, always one to hold on to his illusions and delusions and shamantic revolutions, was not his usual buoyantly cheerful self as facts seemed less important than point of view and lamentations seemed appropriate. It was a noir time. He could feel the darkness creeping in. He counted ten fingers and he counted ten toes. He felt between his legs, check, check, and check, and was happy to still have teeth and hair. He was older. He'd lost a step or three, but what can you do? He was glad to be alive. But some things were hard to ignore, and nothing focuses the mind like a fire headed your way. That afternoon, the sky was orange, with a spot of sun poking through like an egg yolk. The colors were all wrong. Later, a fortunate shift of wind sent the flames a different direction, and his house would be spared, but others would not be as fortunate. He'd taken note of the lilies of the valley that had come with August, and were now in their last glory, and dreamed about a large-scale work of art. Only big would work, only Bam would wow. The artist must make a noise. The time for noise was now. Ready, aim, pow. Art Smitten told him there was no need to worry about pushing art forward. Technology would take care of that. Art was now an open language, a tool to impart an expression. The year before, Marlowe had contemplated the birth of modernism concentrating particularly on two ballets, The Rite of Spring and Afternoon of a Fawn, first performed in Paris by the Ballet Russe a hundred years ago. In Marlowe's garden, these became dances of transformation, celebrations of the Ovid hour, when light shifts and things change. Oh, my love, one thing turns into another. All is metamorphosis. We were caterpillars, then butterflies, we marveled at our colors. You red, me blue, as yellow washed between us. Oh, my love, butterfly days are short. Our love is forever. And what the cosmos was now telling Marlowe 
was that the zeitgeist had radically changed and it was time for an original dance, a dance of hope, a dance of resistance. Marlowe stared into the dimming distant canyon and projected images. A parallel reality was taking form. Movies were appearing before his eyes. He saw every faint star as a lover, every moonlight flower too. How many times can we fall in love? How beautiful that feeling, the stuff of songs, that split second flicker, that spark in the dark. Eyes meet across a room, eyes look down. Images were piling up. A story began to take shape. At first, no plot, no conscious theme, no coherency of ideas, mostly nonsensical prattle, but Marlowe was getting a peek. There were his familiar characters from a distant time, now hurled into a future time. And Marlowe could feel his feet moving and swaying, and he was mumbling crazy words and in a groove, and then nothing. 